And we're into it, Steve Wrigley. Hello, sir. G'day. So I can't even, like, uh, change the... Like, I want to get to my webcam settings. Yeah. Oh, so should... that I can change the white balance so... and the exposure level. So people, people and who... give you some kind of decent fixture, but you've got me using this thing called Zoom, <laughs> and I well... <laughs> only know this thing exists because every single person on my friends list is complaining about it. Uh, I look. Apparently, I all you hear on this is people eating soup. I, I, <laughs> I apologise in advance for forcing you to use Zoom. It's just a way to connect. No, it's okay. To studios. That's all it is. But this is your first experience. You are a Zoom virgin, and you're you've had a bad experience with it. It feels like this is this was a painful first experience. And well, and I, I just I, you know, I, I, they, what they don't seem to care about in Zoom is a person being able to tweak a, a webcam settings. You know, disabling autofocus and oh, hold on a minute. But oh no no, that ain't gonna help. How are you, man? How's it going? <laughs> I'm really good. I'm really intrigued um, by by you at the moment and what you're doing because the first thing is, I mean, Kiwi audiences know you from all over the place. What it would be fair to probably say, highest profile you had here on a regular basis was probably Seven Days, like in a, as a consistent sort of that's where Kiwis would see you. Mostly, yeah, I think I mean it'd be pretty pretty safe bet. But obviously, you've been around that show. You've been around forever and a Billy T Award winner, all that kind of stuff. But now, yeah. now it's interesting that you are, and fascinating that you're living in the states. But when I realised yesterday, because you told me that you're living in New York, I went, "Oh, epicenter at the moment of there." But for a lot of Kiwis, they may not. Yeah, get I mean, Man- Manhattan is, a, is the epicenter. That's yeah. like saying, like, like, I live upstate, so that'd be like saying to someone in Wellington that that Auckland is like almost that far away. Yeah, you know. That it's a bit of a stretch but yeah i mean just being in the state in general is pretty interesting because the, the you know it's when you live in america one of the things that you start to learn is how you have to look at this country like europe not not like america like right. I think one of the dumbest things i hear now that i used to say all the time too is when i hear kiwis go oh all americans are stupid yeah, yeah. And i'm like well which ones because texas is to new york what france is to germany yeah, they're yeah, all yeah, completely yeah. different countries each state is its own thing and one of the things about living in New York right now that's really interesting is seeing how it's seeing this government in action and seeing how the states are so hugely independent of the of the federal government and how the sort of weird negotiations in that take place. But yeah, I mean we are far away from um from the epicenter by by a long way. So so the epicenter is basically so. basically New York, New York, and you're saying you're upstate New York. You, yeah, yeah. They're, they're in Manhattan. Yeah, I'm yeah. way out in the country. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do you think Como, uh, Cuomo's doing? He's your, he's your uh, governor, isn't he? Better than better than most, I think. Yeah. You know, I think he. Uh, I don't think any. I don't think there's uh, anyone who who had the crystal ball that you needed to to navigate this thing perfectly. Uh-huh. I th- uh, he, I mean, you know, he's one of the people who sort of started listening to experts really i mean this that's the you can put your leadership in two categories i guess around the world there are people who kind of got on the phone to people from the world health organization yeah and went well you know more about this than me so let's put your plan into action and then you've got people like trump who went okay i've heard everything you had to say let me think about it yeah and they were kind of like no no you don't like we've done we've done the thinking we've been thinking about this for like two decades and we've all trained hard to be the people who think about this i don't think Donald Trump thinking about this for another day is going to add anything. Well, other than to the, other um, than casualties, perhaps. Other than casualties, a hundred percent, right? But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we've got a governor here who actually listens and puts the plans into action, and you know, they tell him thirty thousand ventilators is what he's going to need, and that's what he's trying to get. So, yeah, I think he's doing a pretty, pretty, pretty decent job considering the the situation and uh you know i think he's also doing a really good job of like i heard him on the radio yesterday letting everyone know that you know we're the rate of doubling is going the rate at which we're doubling cases is slowing so mm. while we're still mm. increasing we're increasing slower so he and you know it's just refreshing when you hear a politician say uh you know we've, i've got good news and bad news not just i've got all the good news yeah. and now for the bad news 
here's a guy I'm firing next week. You well, know? and uh, I guess unless you're Trump, and then it's, the bad news gets wrapped up as uh, this is really good news. I heard him the other day say, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but the death toll could have been two and a half million. So 250,000 is basically a win. Dude, the bad news is just him just him getting up there really how, how do you like, miss I don't know. How, how are you missing jacinda um yeah i you know one of them one of the most like a little thing but a big thing for me was hearing grant robertson actually at a, mm. at a press conference being asked by a reporter like um are you going to be able to save everyone's job or some dumb some dumb reporter question where they're trying to get their headline where they say Grant Robinson says not every job will be saved or whatever. Yeah. But I just found his response was really good because he just said, no, obviously not. Like we're in the middle of a pandemic. Well, obviously there's going to be casualties, human and economical. We're not going to be able to save everyone's job. We're going to do everything that we can to make it. And then he just sort of see the reporter there going, oh, well, that's kind of what I wanted, but now I don't want it anymore. You know, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I definitely miss the leadership back home just because it is leadership. You know, it's the, the hugest difference between there and here is, um, uh, you know, Jacinda has the ability to communicate yep. and, and that's such a huge part of leadership is like, it's not just what the plan is. It's how you get everyone who you need to follow the plan to follow it. Yeah. Right. You don't just come out there and go. Well, I'm going to say my thing and then everyone's going to follow it because I'm the boss. Yep. You know, that works when everyone's getting a paycheck from you and they either do yeah. what you say, you can fire them, <laughs> which is what Trump is used to. He's yeah, not yeah, used yeah. to the idea that you go, okay, I'm the leader of a country and half of these people don't want to fucking listen to me. So I have to be considerate and worded. You know, the whole thing with him of just not wanting a teleprompter in there and not realizing that. The reason that in the States, particularly a president has to do that is because they have a team of people who look over every word that comes out yep. to make sure that when you've got something like this, you know, all those evangelical numpties in the Bible belt are also going to, they're, they're going to get, they're going to follow the rules of the briefing just as much as all the sort of libs in the dance clubs in the middle of New York City, yeah. you know, they're, but they're with him, there's no, it's just... Oh, well, I'll tell everyone to stay inside and wash their hands and they'll do it. Job done. Bye, everyone. So, and and, that, and just, that, there's no communication skills in and, the White House. And that from that briefing, if one thing is said slightly incorrectly or if there is a turn of phrase used slightly wrongly, then, I mean, it's not so much a problem at the moment with the uh, stock exchange because it's crashed, but that could actually change the outcome. On a, it's, it's, that, it's the dominoes effect, several, you know, issues away so kind of freewheeling it like he's doing it when he can't do it almost as badly as biden um it's, yeah, it's, I, don't, I don't think yeah. he understands human i think numbers are the only thing that he gets do you know what i mean i don't think he understands i don't think i mean you know imagine what his whole life has been like yeah like how many times has his sort of humanity ever played a role in anything he's ever done yeah and people bring him these sheets with numbers on them and their death, their deaths and infections and stuff. But he just looks at them like, I don't know, like a balance sheet for a business. Yeah, you know. Or if you get and, uh, if you get told, sir, we've got three hundred and thirty million dollars and we're going to lose a hundred thousand dollars, you kind of go, oh, well, that's that's not such a bad loss this year. That's not that's not so bad. Yeah, but, no, but each one of those dollars, sir, is someone's <laughs> grandmother or grandfather or yeah. son or daughter. Yeah. Um, I don't really. I mean, well, I guess if I lost one of my sons, I've got two, <laughs> and a couple of hidden daughters out there as well. <laughs> yeah, pr probably. Lord I, knows. I wonder. Um, the the whole thing that you know, Texas is to New York, what Germany is to France, sort of thing. I think the yeah. the clue for that is in the title, isn't it? The United States, as in they're a group of separate economies yes. that are united together, and I don't think people kind of get that. Um, they don't get it. No, it's like saying European Union. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. you've got a group of of countries kind of making up this one big thing that's called Europe. Yeah. You know, where in we got to, uh, you know, but the, st the only different thing with the states is just the weirdness of the, I don't know, the kind of go the way, I don't know. I, I sit here as a New Zealander sometimes and go, there's got to be an easier way to do this, guys. Well, I like, I mean, I've always, every time I talk to, like, in an interview or podcasting setting to an American who's sort of politically minded, I always say to them, you know, is America the best country in the world? And they say, yes. And I, say, I always ask them, what's your metric for that? 
Because, you know, I know that Usain Bolt is the fastest man in the world because he runs the 100 metres the quickest. I have a metric which I can measure it. What's the metric that you measure that America is the greatest country in the world? And very rarely is there an actual answer that comes out. So, uh, although I did see one the other day, a sarcastic post by someone on Twitter um, that was like American exceptionalism, we're number one, and it was the number of coronavirus cases. So that wasn't such a good thing, but they were they were being a bit <laughs> slightly sarcastic. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> yeah, but I, 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 I wonder, like with that, the United States, I wonder how, I mean, this is a global pandemic. I wonder if that is as much of a hindrance as well to, to sort this out because, um, you know, it's like, as you say, it's, it's like 50 different countries negotiating from one central point about the help that they need. Like it's like all of Europe yeah. negotiating from, let's say, from the UN for all getting help at the same time. And that could also be as big. And so we go, we're one country and we share all these resources, but actually when we need to operate as individual countries, states, whatever it is, then that's one of the reasons this is going to fall down so badly for America. Well, there, the, the, the tragedy is, mate, is that actually the way that their government is set up should have helped them deal with this better because, you know, it's a huge chunk of 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 the continent and the the northern border is pretty easy to secure the southern border um you know kind of is what it is but yep. then during a pandemic they can they can do a lot more but i mean the real the real thing is is of course because all of the the international airports are under like federal jurisdiction uh -huh. so they were actually in a position to you know instead of um 50 separate countries all closing their international airports at the same time, the federal government could have closed all 50 countries' um, international ports of entry yep. at the same time, like a long time ago. You know, uh, the, I mean, we've talked, to, it's been talked to, to death, obviously, but like the timeline here is just a mess. You yeah, know, yeah. you have this guy going, Donald Trump going, there's no problem, there's no yeah. problem, there's no problem, there's no it's problem. It's going to go from 15 to 1. And again, this one. comes back to that communication thing, because yeah, he yeah. goes, there's no problem, there's no problem, there's no problem, there's no problem. Then he goes, uh, it turns out there's a problem, <laughs> and we're going to suspend all flights from Europe for the next 30 days. And that was the end of his message. Yeah. There was nothing in there where he then went, like, because no one came up to him and said, oh, hey, so when you say that, every American who is currently in Europe is going to panic yeah. and they're all going to try to come home at once. So we need to make sure in your messaging that you're letting every American who's abroad know that this only applies to non-citizens and non-residents. Yep. And that any time over that 30-day period, if you're American, obviously you'll still be able to come back into the country, mm -hmm. but there'll be quarantine measures, right? That person doesn't, if they are saying that to him, he's not hearing it. Well, that's also and valid, so isn't he it? Yeah, well, he created this mass panic. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, every single American who was abroad all traveling back here at once. And then on the same day, well, not the same day, a couple of days later or whatever, when everyone was coming back in, he goes, he just, this is, these are the things that he does that kind of, you know, there's nuances to it that just mean everything falls apart, where he says, okay. Uh, every single person who comes into the country is going to be tested, yeah. right? So the president says that. Now, as far as the federal department is concerned, every single person who crosses an international border into the United States is now going to be tested for COVID-19, right? This is like when he said, when he became president, no more Muslims are allowed in, yeah. right? So then it became federally mandated that Muslims were not allowed to cross the border. The president has said that. Problem is, is that's as much as he's done in the business meeting. So there's been no administrative uh, work done at all. And there are all these people going, what does that mean? I work in border security. I've just been told that as of this minute, I'm not supposed to let, an let another Muslim come through, mm -hmm. but that's all I've been told. I haven't been given any procedures. I haven't been given, do I just ask them? Is there some kind of test that I can perform to find out what this, so the same thing happened with COVID-19 where he goes, oh, everyone who comes into the country is going to be tested. Okay, the president's now mandated that. So we have to test everyone who's coming in. How do we do that? Do we yeah, have any yeah. tests? We don't have any tests. What do we do? Take everyone's temperature. Okay, we'll take everyone's temperature at the border and look for symptoms. And then what? Okay, well, that's going to take a while. So then they created this log jam at the airport, dude, yep. where there were like seven hour long lines of people getting off their flight. And you've got people who are coming from all over the world 
jammed in these terminals like sardines for seven hours with people who'd come in from China yeah. and people who'd come in from Italy. To the point, bro, where like if you were paranoid enough, you would literally go, the only reason to do this is because you've sat down and gone, what is the most effective way we can spread this virus to as many <laughs> Americans as possible. Do you know what I mean? I know you laugh, but yeah, right, yeah. it's no, the no, only thing that makes no, no. sense. Because yeah. those two things back to back, getting everyone to get on their plane at the same time, at the time where everyone was their most infectious, and then jamming all of them into airport corridors by creating all of these administrative delays. I mean, you go, it's either incompetence or there's like a grand scheme at play. And there, I don't know which one makes me feel more comfortable. They're there, both terrifying. Me. There, are, look, I don't know if these words have ever come out of my mouth before, but in defense of Trump, I think it feels a bit, I kind of threw up in the back of my mouth a little bit saying that. But we have. You had a terrible day. We had, yeah. We had, um, let's say with the supermarkets, we had, the, we had that messaging that you think they should have had for the for the uh, you know, international travel you know we were told very clearly there's no need to rush on supermarkets there's plenty of food the food lines aren't going to run out you know all these sorts of things and yet there was still a rush on supermarkets so I, i'm um I'm yeah not... although here's the thing dude i saw that like i saw the new zealand herald or something right. posted the thing that was like <laughs> new zealanders rush on supermarkets and i saw footage of like a line like an orderly line outside of pack and save <laughs> And I laughed because I thought that is New Zealand, right? In a in a panic, like <laughs> we have a fucking Black Friday sale in America where people die, and there's not even a pandemic on, and people are punching each other out in the aisles. Yeah, like, gotcha. And imagine how much worse it would have been if Jacinda had have just come out and gone, "We're closing all the supermarkets tomorrow." Bye. You yeah. Know? Okay. Fair. Which fair, is kind fair of point. what Trump would have done. Yeah. Fair point. Fair point. So what you're saying is, so we, you, you, yeah, we had a rush, but if it had been handled like Trump handled the travel. Um, rush it would have been a thousand times worse it would have been a thousand a thousand times worse easily and also i just think that like that that i mean it's disappointing it's obviously disappointing to see people behave that way but i don't think it was you know like there's i mean all i can say is there's definitely going to be enough idiots Mm -hmm. in every suburb of Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch, and every place in between, there's always going to be enough idiots to fill one supermarket. Yeah. Right? In every suburb, there's enough idiots in that suburb for one supermarket, and all the smart ones are the ones who are at home going, yeah, I'm pretty sure there's more toilet paper on the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm yeah. pretty sure there's going to be more bread next week. I also think that... Um there's a mindset as to where to shop as well. I noticed here in Dunedin. So we have a pack and save. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the pack and save got super, super busy, but I live in the northern part of Dunedin where there's a little village and a, a nice new world. Nothing special, but, you know, a nice new world. Wasn't busy at all. Like there were there were plenty of people. That were, when I say it wasn't busy, it was busy, but it wasn't the overflows. Everyone was rushing to pack and save. And I was, okay, so I'll pay an extra 10 cents for my toilet paper, but I'll not be crammed in there where, you know, with people every one and a half meters away from me sort of thing. So yeah, yeah. So it was you know it, it, it wasn't too bad. But the thing that confused me about the shopping thing was I couldn't understand people being at the supermarket like the day after our lockdown, because I thought or, the, or like two days or three days after, because I thought you know surely you can at least get enough veggies and food to last you know the first week. I thought they should that they'd be empty for the first week. But then again, maybe people went well. I'll just wait till the first or second day because they'll be empty, and they certainly weren't. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. It's like you got to decide what you want. You know. Pat, you gotta, do you want do you want everyone going to the supermarket on the the day of the lockdown, or do you want them kind of coming and going over that kind of happened over anyway. the course of a week? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, what is the actual yeah. what is the actual um, situation in New York? Like, what are you being? Have you got restrictions on travel? How you? Because we're all. I mean, you know this obviously. We're all housebound unless you're an essential service. Is there anything that Can you're you being imagine? Enforced? Can you imagine? Imagine in the United States of America trying to say and you're not allowed to leave your house and if you do without paperwork the police can arrest you that Sh- sentence alone show me your papers would would just 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 if if any government official said you're a u.s citizen but we the government are telling you that you're not allowed to leave your house <laughs> and if you do we're going to put you in jail is just you that is just a nightmare waiting to happen this country will not accept that on any terms. So where we are right now is a suggestion. Other Outside of New York City, 
where they they have enforced it right in new york city they're they're in an enforced lockdown right um but to try out here where we live like i this is the wild like we this we're in trump territory like i know we're in new york state but the county that we're in is very pro-trump this is very america freedom and new york city is a different story but i think that for them for for this for, for if the if if the federal government imposes a like mandatory lockdown here yeah that is enforced by law i'll be amazed and i think that's one of the places where they're very careful about what they say you know because there's that whole don't tread on me sort of freedom thing going on here but i mean yeah there are places where the, there's a lockdown but then from what i understand even in new york city so the enforcement of it is quite you know it's quite dicey and it's quite difficult to they're only like locking down certain streets in certain areas right i'm not sure the the i'm not sure the exact details there but yeah we're in a like we got a pamphlet in the mail that actually this is really funny i got my dad to send me the one from new zealand i wish i had the other one on hand i'd hold it up to camera um this is i think one of the big differences between trump and and jacinda as well Mm -hmm. it's like so so my dad showed me the you know government advisory for COVID 19 mm-hmm. and it is so new zealand government right mm-hmm. it is this non-partisan yellow there's not a single shred of a party color no national no labor no branding nothing yep. it is just a boring yellow informative document that a government communications department put together independent of party lines mm-hmm. right here we get president trump's plan to survive (laughs) COVID 19 you know and it's all trump branded and it's his whole scenario and then down in the bottom and very tiny very tiny cdc logo kind of down the bottom and all this white house and trump admin shit like all over it you know which is super weird because in new zealand they'd go oh no you're trying to brand like the taxpayers paid for this response yeah and you're trying to package it up in your campaign language and that's a huge conflict of interest and you definitely can't do that like new zealand you know what i mean new zealand has those things where they kind of think about that sort of stuff whereas here it's just like nope he's the president if he wants to put his big stupid face on the COVID 19 pandemic response pamphlet that's going out to every household in america let's let him do it sounds good to me I don't know. It's really those are like the, the subtleties of America that make it a super odd place to live right now. I also wonder as because, well, not just America, but maybe maybe the world, maybe, maybe the world previous to us all accepting this. When I say us all, I mean the you know, the norms accepting it's a real thing. Is that we have had in this century, you know, the Ebola outbreak, which was terrible in, in parts of Africa. We've had H one N one. We've had bird flu, and none of those have eventuated into the you know, screaming chyrons on Fox News and CNN what they could have been. And I wonder how much people are now kind of going, yeah, we've we've heard this we've heard this story before and it never eventuates. And I, I don't know, is that, is that a feeling in America that is one of the reasons people are kind of going, you know, it's, I, I think Team America, you know when, you, a, when you explain saying, America. There's a saying here right now, which is that everyone thinks it's a hoax until their granddad dies. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Which is kind of, I think just you know this it's just so simple but it's so to the point because you can't see it and we don't show you know they i was talking to i've got some family who work in nursing in there and one of them said wow. if we want to keep everyone inside we'll just show them footage of a person dying of this yeah and you'll never fucking touch anything ever again <laughs> once you see how a person dies from this you'll be like i'm good i'll I live in my freaking bathroom. Everyone becomes Haley you know. Mandel. Yeah, but I mean, I think that's it, though, is that, you know, you go, you don't, they don't really, you see sort of people walking around on the news and sort of face shields and things, but you yeah. don't, you know, it's not like, a, for some reason we can show, you know, um, children's bodies covered in blood under rubble in syria yep. on the news yep. like we're allowed to do that to shock people into thinking something's going on yeah but a person choking to death on their own lung fluid in a hospital bed during a pandemic is it's a little too on the nose i'm not really too sure what the the line is there for for journalism and it's not i guess not my place to determine it but 
Yeah, man, the, the, the you know, that's really, it's the, for everyone here, it's a myth until it hits home, you know? Right. And uh, unless you're not an idiot, you know, that's for, I think for people who are sensible and who are smart and who can grasp, like, I, I'm sure that for a lot of people, dude, even just grasping the concept of a virus and how it works is beyond them. I didn't even really know what, how they operated until I watched uh, Jacinda Ardern was sitting down with two doctors. Yeah. And they were talking about why washing your hands works, mm -hmm. right? And I actually had, like, I had no idea up until that point. But as soon as I saw that, as soon as the government gave out some information and went, so this is what it actually does, that really helps inform me yeah, right. of going, oh, okay, so every time I've gotten the flu, that's what's actually happened. I get it now. You know, like, I kind of knew. Like, I knew how you got sick, but I didn't know, know it down to the brass tacks. But I think for any person who is trusting of leadership i guess that's a big thing and trust the information that they get from them as soon as we heard about the do's and don'ts and then because we have effective communication and leadership we didn't just hear what the do's and don'ts were we were told why yep. they were do's and don'ts so that we could get our head around it sure but i think so many people don't even listen to that you know they just don't they just go oh yeah like you say like they go we've oh yeah it's just gonna be another it's going to be another, another Ebola, flu, especially yeah. here in the States, because yeah. here in the States, it's even worse, dude. Here in the States, it's not it's another Ebola. Here in the States, it's another impeachment trial. You know, <laughs> here in the States, whether COVID-19 is real or not, is in the same basket uh, as whether Donald Trump made an extortionary phone call to the leader of the Ukraine. Wow. I was, just, I was just thinking um, Dave Chappelle describes where you live as living, living with the dusty white people. So you live in an area with the dusty white people, the Trump voters. That's it. So I tell you a story about where I live. Yeah, go this, for is, it. this is this uh, this is this I think is is it about perfectly kind of sums up what it's been like. So 2016 um, election cycle, and I'm standing outside a friend of mine's house here. So I've been living here for six years now. We moved here when my son was born, so that he could be closer to my wife's uh, parents, and uh, and obviously very pro. Hillary, right? There yeah. are there's a lot of things about her that still I mean she could go this is the weird thing about being from New Zealand is like here they talk about Hillary being like a leftist and a liberal and yeah, I'm like yeah, yeah. I don't know, man, she could swing a little further left <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. She'd right? fit like, nicely in the national party. A hundred percent, right? Yeah, yeah. I, it's always real funny getting that across to people here of going, dude, like in my country, she's like barely center right, man. Like she's, you know, our, She's, um, our right wing, our right wing uh, prime minister supported same sex marriage. Americans' heads, yeah. gone. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's so true though. Yeah, like I mean, don't get me started on on Simon Bridges. I'm not sure what, his, <laughs> what the story is there at the moment, but um, so uh, I was at a friend's house and he and I had been chatting about about gun rights. He's a veteran. He has a few guns in his house. Mm -hmm. My position on guns is, um has changed a lot since since moving here and i definitely feel uh i feel like there's more of a discussion to be had than people just screaming get rid of all of the guns at the people who have them yeah um you know i know that's not going to get us anywhere but uh but this these two people on motorcycles pulled up and one of them had a trump uh, bumper sticker this was before trump won mm -hmm uh this was this is before trump won he was still sort of a, a joke now the night before we'd actually been out at a uh the the local legion which is i guess i guess it's like a rsa yeah kind of right the local legion here and there were a, a bunch of people drinking and we we're talking to this woman uh about the about politics and and she said that she wanted to vote for trump and this was actually the first time that i had met one of them that I'd met one of the people that liked him. This was before. <laughs> this was your, I think this was before he was even the Republican nominee. Sounds like your white, just your white rhino. Some, I saw I saw one in the distance, and finally I came across one. Yeah, well, because imagine being from New Zealand, right? Yeah, yeah. You just go, okay, there's like this, just there's no way that this guy's going to even get elected, let alone there's someone who supports him. <laughs> and one of my friends said to her, he goes, "Well, what do you think about Trump saying that if his daughter wasn't his daughter, he would." go on a date with her and she genuinely thought about it and goes uh well if my, i mean if my son wasn't my son oh shit he's kind of handsome at which point my friend said yeah actually you probably should vote for donald trump actually 
I think you've found your guy. Yeah. Wow. But the next day after that, we were outside. This couple come up on their motorcycles and they got a Trump sticker in there. And I said, oh, I see you're supporting Trump. I met, met my first Trump supporter last night, not from here. You know, what is it that, that, uh, what is it that appeals to, to you about him? And he said, oh, he's not, he's not like Hillary Clinton. Yep. And I said, oh, what's the problem with Hillary Clinton? And then, so then we got, we got to talking and then we got to talking about guns, right? And I was kind of talking to him about, because he asked me what, what gun laws were in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, well, you know, like it's, it's just restricted. Like you, I could own a hunting rifle in New Zealand if I wanted one. I could even own a pistol mm -hmm. in New Zealand if I wanted one. Um, but if I want to have one, <clears throat> I have to prove to the state that I would be responsible with it. And the, in the same way that like you have to prove to the state that you are responsible with a vehicle before yeah. they unleash you on a motorway with one so i have to prove to the state that i know what i'm doing i have to show them that i have a gun safe where i'll keep them i have to show them that i know how to use it you know like i really essentially just they just need to know that i'm not going to shoot myself in the face and that my kid's not going to come and find it and shoot somebody with it and that my whole reason for owning it is that are all correct and in order right yep so this guy he goes oh, yeah, well, my wife and I talk about that all the time. We think that it's way too easy to get a gun here and uh, that they give them to idiots who don't know how to use them. And we totally think that, you know, they need to, They everyone should be able to have a gun, but if you're going to have one, you should learn how to use it. And I said, okay, so, so then you actually would probably be quite heavily on board with Hillary Clinton's p policy on the Second Amendment. He goes, no, I wouldn't. And I go, well, no, I mean, she's <laughs> what she wants to do is less strict than what we have in New Zealand. She's basically saying all that, and you can have like a semi automatic rifle as well an AR 15 or whatever, you know? Yeah, you can have, well, I think, I think for her, like a fully automatic would have been out of the question. No. I think the AR 15 probably might have been out. I don't know don't really i'm not like a gun freak i don't get horny over them so i don't even know which ones do what but like i said to this guy i go hey look dude like what you're what you want hillary's wants to actually bring that in yeah and he and he goes no she doesn't she wants to take everyone's guns away and i said no, she doesn't dude she's actually really pro second amendment um she she doesn't want to take your guns away at all she just wants to you know make sure that people who have them are going to be smart about it yeah and he goes, no, she doesn't. They're gonna if she gets into office, everyone's guns will be gone within a month. And I said, okay, dude, I'm gonna bring up her website. So I got out my cell phone, <laughs> and I brought up her website, and I said, right here, I have her position on the Second Amendment from her official website that I can show you right now. It's four paragraphs. I can read it to you. And he went, I'm not looking at that fucking bitch's website, okay? And I went, well, what are we doing here then, man? Like. The reason you vote for a person is because they're trying to bring about policies that you that line up with what you think. Mm. And here I am standing in front of you going, you know what, mate? Like I used to think I was a national voter, right? When I was a kid, because all of my friends, dads and that, voted national, two yep. ticks blue, that's what you do. Yep. And I just thought they were the party to vote for. I never even looked at any of the politics or anything. And then when I voted in my first election, it was a, a girl that I knew was like, what do you, th you know, we were talking about politics. And she went, well, I actually think you, when you talk to me about the things that you want, I actually think you're more of a Labour voter. And I was like, no, I'm not. I'm a national voter. Yeah. You know? And she goes, well, and then so she actually made me go and look. And then I went, oh, yeah, all the <laughs> things that I do want are going to come with a Labour government. Okay. Oh, I guess that's who I vote, you know? I didn't go and go, no, 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 no. Because what happens here in the States, and I could tell what was going on with that guy too, it was that, no, because because if I accept that what I want is Hillary Clinton, then when I go to the biker bar tomorrow mm -hmm. and all of my mates start talking about how we, if fucking Hillary Clinton tries to come and take our guns away, we're all going to hole ourselves up in a house and, you know, shoot everyone and we're, we're going to die f free men or whatever, I'm going to have to go, oh, hold on, guys, actually, we've been completely wrong about this Hillary Clinton thing. And that is just too huge of a change to yeah. his 
social fabric for him to just just accept so it's just easier for him to just block it out and continue to live under the illusion that red or dead you know vote for trump and not actually wind up getting you know what he wants in the end yeah i i there's two quick examples which i think of that kind of echo that the first is an american one when you um you know when they say do you support obamacare and you know 60 percent of republicans 70 percent of republicans say no they, they don't support Obamacare. But then when they take the word Obamacare off, they take the affordable, um, whatever it is, care bill, whatever it's called, anyway, off, and they actually list out the items within it, like 70% then support it. So it's it's just purely that word Obama, and it's come from them that they don't support. And I had a friend here in New Zealand. Which is also weird, you know? Just that whole Obama hatred thing yeah, is yeah. just super odd. And, and America seems to be the best place in the world. I, I, it's probably naive for me to say that because I, I haven't done enough research. But one of the places in the world where politicians are able to get the voters to vote against self-interest, best of anything. I mean, oh, those, those, amazing. those dusty white people that we talk about, that Chappelle talks about, yeah. are actually poor, working class white people where things like Obamacare and you know Bernie's sort of idea around Medicaid, Medicare for all would be the things that actually help them. But I think it comes down to a couple of things. I think one is what you've already talked about, which is guns, and the other one is um, abortion. And those are two really big driving factors that separate the separate the sides. But what I was going to say is I had a mate in New Zealand uh, uh, several cycles ago, um, got all his friends together and stripped all the names off the political parties and just put their policies out there. And in a group of you know 10 people said, pick the policies you like. And everyone was shocked at what party in this you know, uh, game, basically, they ended up supporting at the end of it because that's they just looked at the policy as nothing else. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, but no one does. Like, dude, I was here for the entire election cycle in 2016. Mm-hmm. I watched all three of the debates and I could not tell you what anyone's fucking policy was coming yeah. out of that. <laughs> all I knew coming out of that was that a lot of people thought Donald Trump forced himself on a ton of women. Yep. And a lot of people thought that that didn't happen. Right. And that's all that I managed to get out of weeks and weeks and weeks of news and rhetoric and debates and promotional ads and campaigns. I never once got any sort of shred of an understanding of particularly what Donald Trump's policies were what he kind of wanted to do he would just say weird things like that he was you know that when he like that whole thing where he started talking about how he was pro-life and i was like come how many abortions come have you on, paid dude yeah. you've paid for a couple man yeah, yeah, you've got a sure. few abortions on your fucking tab and you're not gonna <laughs> you can't convince me otherwise mm. you know yeah there it- are some hotel workers out there who had some <laughs> hospital time paid for by donald j trump and who are now living in very nice houses one would think a (laughs) hundred percent you know and abortions are we abortions like not it's just so triggering to people for me personally right i i I talked i was trying to explain it to someone here because they i said i was saying look i i don't like it i don't like the idea of it right if i if i got someone pregnant if, if me and a, a girl slept together and she's pregnant the next day and she tells me that she doesn't want to have a kid and she wants to have an abortion i would be super sad about that right i would be super super sad about it and there would probably be many days throughout my life where my consciousness would circle back around to the child that never was yeah and i'd have a little sad think about that and i'd be super bummed out about it but ultimately, I don't get a fucking say, you know. And also, and I, I don't get—I can't force her to have the baby. Mm-hmm. And also, I can't. There's no part of me that would lay out some huge guilt trip to try and convince her not to. What I would have to do as that guy is go. All right. Well, this is—you know—it's not her choice to have an abortion that put you here. It was your choice to have unprotected sex with someone that 
did not feel the same way about having a kid as you that has put you in this position this woman that you've slept with and is now going to abort your child is going to go and do that and you have no I don't, I don't have any right to tell her not to i don't have any moral right to make her feel bad about doing it i, I just have to fucking wear it yeah. okay every time i feel sad about it it's my fault for putting myself in this position right i don't need to be okay with someone getting an abortion to i don't need to you know, be personally spiritually okay with it to recognize that it's not my place mm -hmm. to determine what happens after the fact with my fertilization squirt right i knew that at a very young age i knew that i would have a problem with conceiving a child with someone right and not seeing that child ultimately be born which is why i was very careful about who i slept with mm -hmm. and how i slept with them and didn't put myself in a position to have that that happen and, and I realize I get it. Like, I understand that it still could have happened. I, nothing is going to change emotionally how I would feel about it, right? But I can reason myself into a place where I go, but then that's just, that's just it. I 100% believe in a woman's right to choose. And mm. I will vote for a political party that will give a woman the right to choose, despite the fact that if I found myself in that situation, I would personally be very sad and be very hurt that it was happening. I still don't feel like that emotional state gives me the right to have law enforcement now force this woman to have my child, right? Yep. And that to me is like, you know, and I realize, I know there are people who get will just be like, well, you should just be fine with it. Well, guess fucking what? People aren't just fine with shit, okay? Like, I'm, and, and luckily, I've never been in a situation where this has had to, I've had to deal with this, mm. right? But emotionally, it would be difficult. I'm not going to be, I, it would be, I, I would not be able to put myself in a position where, yeah, go freaking, <laughs> go get that abortion, right? I'd be as supportive as I possibly could. You know, I would try to maintain as healthy a relationship as I possibly could with the person in question, right? But it's that understanding where your emotional feelings about something, but your rights over another human being, you know, but here in the States, particularly when it comes to abortion, the way people feel about it emotionally, and it's not just abortion, it's a lot of things. The way people feel about things emotionally immediately determines how they think things should be administered legally. Yeah, and, you who, know? and who to vote for. And who to vote for. Yeah. Whereas at the end of the day, whether or whether uh, as a man whether a woman winds up pregnant with your child or not you have a tremendous amount of control right you have trust me men have way more control over who winds up pregnant with their kid than women do mm. weirdly right like we're but and i'm obviously i'm talking about the horrors of sexual assault and everything right mm -hmm. men uh we have such a huge amount of of uh of control over that because all we have to do to not ever have to go through someone choosing to abort a baby that we've fertilized is to just not sleep with that person yeah right you just you you know i realize how freaking murky these waters could probably get for people who want to take whatever i'm saying any kind of way but i don't know dude i just that's the thing for me that i think particularly in new zealand i think it's something that really being such a progressive country is that we are able to do that we're able to go well here's how i feel emotionally about that yep, yep, yep. i'm really fucked off at brian because of whatever he did but legally i'm not i don't need to ruin his whole life over it you know i don't, I don't know you know yeah well the, the other Where thing i is feel and the, what the, i want to the do democrats used to say uh, and i think bill clinton coined the phrase that abortion should be safe legal and rare that was their kind of right. that was their kind of stance um, back in the nineties, I think, um, and it was the way that Hillary tried to continue on with that talking about. Uh, it's funny. This I mean, I, I talked to a journalist here in New Zealand yesterday on a podcast, and uh, this conversation came up then as well because we were talking American politics, and it seems to be intertwined with American politics. And I said to him, "What I what I'll say to you, which is 
my thoughts on abortion, which is a weird thing to say, but it's like, you know, you talk about pro-life and pro-choice and I always say I'm in neither camp because both camps now are political. I'm pro-person. And sometimes pro-person, you sit alongside the people who are pro-choice and sometimes you sit along people who are pro-life. And as a pro-person kind of um, advocate, uh, you're there for the people and whatever that means they need to do. And that's safe legal and rare um, idea I think what that means is it needs to be there as you say woman's choice ultimately um, uh, yeah, but it, yeah. but it's not a form of contraception general in, in general society no I, I mean yeah I mean I mean it's 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 obviously from a health standpoint it's not very healthy to no. use it to use that as a form of contraception no. it's just a really appalling health choice but yeah I mean I just you know I'm uh, like I was really pleased that New Zealand made the decision they made recently. I'm very pro women being able to live comfortably knowing that that option is there for them without any external pressures whatsoever. Right. Yeah. It did I seem a bit ridiculous awesome. that it was still a crime. I mean, I don't know. There was a lot of, yeah. there was a lot of, um, a lot of people, a lot of, uh, you know, particularly religious people, obviously, who were very keen not to have it come off the books. But it just seems that whether you support, like, pro-life or pro-choice, that at the day we're living in today in 2020, it is a part of society. I think it's probably accepted, quote-unquote accepted, by most in society, probably significantly most in society, like a high percentage, that it's still to be a crime seems to be yeah to get it off the books was the right thing to do absolutely oh a hundred percent and but that's why it's such a it's such a difficult issue here because particularly in the states there's so much like you know pa- quote unquote passion right mm. and then so, so i've i've had this discussion with many people when i was trying to convince i mean i've stopped it was when i first moved here i was trying to you know liberalize all of the <laughs> the, du- the dusty white folks the dusty that white I met folks. out here <laughs> And when I was trying to, you know, and I thought, well, I'll be coming to them from a place of empathy. But, you know, I immediately started getting hit with like, oh, well, you know, that I was basically, you know, if 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 I got someone pregnant and they went and had an abortion and I didn't do anything about it, that I was, you know, not being heroic. You know, that I there was a life there that needed to be saved wow. and all that sort of stuff and i think it's that that's that that idea that like there's this sort of to to say that abortion is um is not a crime is to say that it's okay and to say that it's okay is to say that you know it's okay to sort of murder the helpless or whatever is this as if you if you bend your opinion or or bend your position if you show nuance one percent then you might as well go all the way it's like if you even if you give an inch you've given a mile that's their position yeah, yeah, which is uh, obviously hugely ironic because a lot of these people are also super pro death penalty. That's so a, it's that's really the best weird. example. Yeah, I mean that's. Uh, but I, I mean, they just can't. They can't. It's that difficulty. Like in New Zealand, I think we just. I don't know. Like we grow up with this ability, I guess, to just understand because we see it. You know, and I also like I have huge arguments with people over here at the moment about socialism because I, <laughs> I kind of try to tell them that like. It's not like Bernie Sanders is not a socialist. No, he's he wants to give you guys socialized medicine, which is a socialized service, and that's really good. Like yeah. it's good to socialize things within the government. Yeah, but I feel that in New Zealand we just like I you know, growing up with that understanding that like if you lower the cost of education, and more people in your country can get educated, there's going to be a huge benefit to your nation a couple of decades down the track. Yep, right. And I think one of the big things, especially when you're a Labour supporter, you are someone who is a big picture thinker like that because you do go, okay, like I can see, I can see how that is going to be a benefit to the person next to me and to the people in my greater community. And I kind of, I can kind of understand how looking after everyone is also looking after me Mm -hmm. because if you're the only person who's doing well and you're surrounded by people who are struggling, yeah eventually you're going to be the dude with his head on a spike. Yeah, right? absolutely. So, so um, that, but that, that, that sort of idea that looking after the person next to you is also looking after yourself doesn't really exist here in a very big way, especially in, in the red 
you know dusty white folks parts of this country where, which is weird you know the it's weird that that doesn't exist because they're often those conservative christian religious people and everything within that kind of message is look after the widows and orphans that's the that's a massive part of that message yeah but then that's why that's like it's a meme it's basically a meme now you know it would have been a political what we would have called a political talking point back in the day but that idea of just being super concerned about this unborn fetus but then as soon as it's born yeah fuck it you know it's it's on its own and it's got to, you know it's got to sort its own yeah its own shit out you know we and, want it and that's um, why and that's why i think the uh the the pro life movement should change their name to the pro live birth movement if you were pro live birth because then actually you know, I don't care about the food stamps to feed the kid if if it, if it needed that, or I don't care. And I support the death penalty and I support war. So it's actually not pro life; it's pro life birth. Once that thing is born, to well, do you know what I think it is? I think it's pro control, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pro control. It's it's exactly what I was talking about before. I emotionally would want that baby to be born, right? Probably. Yeah. And I'm just purely sp speaking hypothetically here because I've never. The only woman who's ever been pregnant with my child is the one person I really wanted to have a kid with. Nice. And we had him. And he's amazing, right? But what I think it is, is it's about wanting control. It's about being pro-control. It's about going, I have control over this person. And, you know, they they want to be able to do this with their body. I want to be able to force them to do this. And then when you, you know, death penalty is the same thing. It's feeling like you can just kind of keep everything under the thumb, under control. Everyone's going to behave the way that you want them to, you know. Um, whereas it's just, you know, the, the irony is is that it's not really, you, it's all just kind of an illusion because what they want is for a woman who they've never met, whose story they'll never hear, mm -hmm. whose reasons for having an abortion they'll never understand, to just not be able to do it because then they can go to sleep at night with some weird illusion of control that they have, I don't know, stopped God from getting upset or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. You know, it's, it's just, it's a weird, but you can't convince any of these people of anything. Like I was just, I put, posted a little video to Facebook yesterday because I was so just dismayed to see this, this pillow salesman oh. who I'd been making fun of. <laughs> the pillow um, king. Standing next to Trump. But dude, if you look at what I was talking about there, like, and this guy's commercial for his pillow mm -hmm. is dog shit. Like it's absolute dog shit. Like his Kiwis, if that had aired in New Zealand, it would have been the laughing stock of the entire country yep. because of just how appalling it was, right? But this guy's made $300 million in pillow sales. And after doing some research, I found out that he's done it because he's all, you know, jesus up the wing wing. <laughs> and there's literally just people in this country who go, which pillow am I going to buy? The this Jesus one line. that was made by scientists or the really kind of dodgy, weird, shitty one that was made by a guy who says he loves God? And then that's enough for them to make their choice. Like all Donald Trump had to do to win the middle states was come out and go, Trump love flag, Trump love God, mm -hmm. Trump hate abortion. And they went, great, awesome. So much so that the point to which they kind of are, are prepared to lie to themselves about things is amazing. The mental gymnastics that I've listened to some people do yeah. in defense of Donald Trump is just like you almost want to give them a round of applause <laughs> for being able to, you know, for being able to kind of lie to themselves in such a perfect little package. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Um, yeah, it's so, I don't know, man. I. So it's, it's this seemed, country though, like I say, it's just a big wild mess. So uh, that's what I was going to was I was going to wanted to ask you about that as well. Uh, obviously, you moved there as you've already said for for family, for Farno, for your wife's um, yeah, parents yeah. and that. And, and is that and what about is that the reason you're staying there? Like you you, you have options. You can you can come or go. So well, what keeps you there? At the moment, COVID nineteen. To be honest, <laughs> um, I was I was supposed to be back for the New Zealand uh, comedy festival this year. Yeah. Um, but I'm not. But I mean, you know, it's been a. So we moved here because my wife, uh, my wife was living with me in New Zealand. She lived with me there for seven years. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, 
her brother was serving in the Air Force and uh, he we lost him, basically. Oh. When we were living in New Zealand, we got a phone call at three o'clock in the morning that he had he died in an accident. And we had, and so many people have gone through, especially when you start to get gray in years like you and I, and you start losing people. <laughs> yeah. But the first, this was, the, this was our first major loss. It was my wife's brother and we dropped everything went back over to the states and um were with her family for three months i cleared my schedule of all, all my work gigs shows tv stuff just basically got my manager was awesome and he just said look you get out of here go be with your wife's family i mean this guy is, he was a super i was so close to this dude he was like a brother to me as well mm. and then when we were here you know grief just kind of flips you upside down and the first month obviously was awful this the, the second month of kind of being here i love this place like where we live is beautiful yeah upstate new york is gorgeous it 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 comes close to new zealand in its natural nice. beauty obviously it doesn't touch it but it comes <laughs> close to it one of the things that i really fell in love with out here are the are seasons there there's this really beautiful thing about living an annual life cycle where you have such a clearly defined summer winter spring and autumn as opposed to new zealand where we just have like tuesday yeah. you know <laughs> and um, and i really fell in love with the place and i said to my wife i was like look you know we, when then we found out we were we were, we were having a baby right we have this this grief baby as i as i jokingly call him <laughs> and uh we sort of made this decision that we would come back here and we'd have the baby close to her mum and dad to kind of try and, and heal the family. Like I talk about the seasons. One of the reasons I love them is because they're this reminder that like things die, but they don't really like things kind of go to sleep and then they kind of come back again, yeah. you know? Yep. And we just went through this awful tragedy, but now as a family, we're about to experience this birth. And so, you know, tragedy gives way to joy and, yeah. you know, yep. it's almost like, you need something to die to fertilize the soil so new things can grow. Uh -huh. And so we decided to, yeah, we'll move out here. And the plan uh, was originally to move to Manhattan. And I was going to try and integrate myself into comedy there. Uh -huh. Leaving New Zealand wasn't that tough of a decision because, you know, I was on seven days every second or third week. And, you know, working on, uh, you know, I was writing for, for, Jono and Ben and I had plenty of stuff going on but also it's like New Zealand so you kind of go well this is it now like right I've you know I've the, my the glass ceiling is yeah. very low yeah, yeah, yeah. and my face was massively squished up against it right and on top of that I just saw all of this talent that was you know <clears throat> your Chris Parkers and Eli Matheson and Rose Matafeo and all of these uh younger comics who I already I mean I was getting as many of them to try and work on Jono and Ben and that as possible. Uh, and so were so many of the other people trying to kind of feed them into seven days because we we're like, look, you know, we were definitely a generation of comics who, um, you know, did something in New Zealand that that changed the face of it by doing seven days and For the sure. way that we were all, that's a whole, that's a whole separate podcast, the way that we were all <laughs> influenced by the London comedy scene and kind of what we managed to do. But you know, I was just kind of looking at everything, going, there's new talent coming through. I've done everything. All I can really do at this point in New Zealand is try and hold on to my spot, right? Because right? there's only so many of them. And holding on to my spot essentially just means like stepping on the necks of younger talent who I'd rather see do well. Because I think me holding on to my spot and just being a curmudgeonly old man of comedy mm -hmm. is ultimately just going to make the scene get boring and stale and we'll go through... A different version of what happened with you know game of two halves and that where you sort of just have it's like it's more bored now so i figured it's not that there's not much i'm not like leaving much you know i'm basically leaving sort of five years of trying to hold on to my spot for dear life um as uh you know and also i mean there was this other part of me that was kind of going and hey, i mean how much longer is tv even going to be a thing yeah you know and look at that decision so yeah, yeah so just le i left and, and, the, and the other thing is dude is that for me, it was not that tough because I go, well, all I've got to do is pick up the phone and call a couple of people in New Zealand and I can fly back. I can do a couple of episodes of seven days, jump on the project, you know, do yep. something, do a skit with Jono and Ben yep, and go and go and do some comedy in Taranaki and Hamilton and Dunedin and Christchurch and whatever over the course of a week. 
and go there for two weeks. And by the time I hop on a plane and come home, I've paid for the cost of my ticket and my comm and, you know, managed to stash a little bit in the back pocket for groceries, which when you live in Western New York, it's not, you don't need a lot to survive. Right. So I was already looking at a pretty decent scenario of, you know, I'll just, I'll just go and be, be away from the family for a couple of weeks and go back to New Zealand every now and then. And then we found this house for 25 grand. And I was like, well, we should just buy it, honey. Like we've got that much money saved up. And like we, our son was six months old at the time. So we bought this house that's uh, 10 miles away from her parents. And uh, I watched YouTube videos on how to fix a house. And I took, I decided I was going to take a year off of, of doing any stand up, And I was just going to spend that year building a house so that my family had kind of somewhere to, to live and then from there i would just kind of satellite out and do comedy and do whatever but at that point as well like my focus had gone from um trying to climb the ladder of entertainment success to just wanting to have four walls that were cozy so that my family and i could all snuggle up at night you know and uh and then I actually, I saw, and then I thought I was, I thought I'd hit the jackpot, dude, because we got the, um, we got the go ahead to make this, this show, uh, word up that I, the producer was a really good friend of mine. She'd worked with me heaps. Uh, we'd always wanted to do something together and she wound up kind of getting me to be this consistent presence on that, that show. I was going to be on every episode and I was like, this is amazing. Cause unlike seven days, which is topical, Word Up was like pre-recorded over two weeks. They recorded every episode. What, so and what, I was like, if this thing is a thing, then what, what's that? What was the actual premise of the show? What was Word Up? Word Up was um, you had three comedians. Oh, sorry, three comedians, three teams. Each comedian had a regular Kiwi as their offsider. Right. Jackie Brown hosted it, and it was kind of in the style of panel shows but also sort of mixed in with game shows. Like we were using a lot of the techniques that made seven days successful, yep. but it was less cerebral and more just kind of silly. And the idea was that these, like my regular Joe Blow Kiwi counterpart kind of provided a good, a good banter point. It was one of those things where it was just a little bit, I think if we, if we had have gotten another season, uh, we would have been able to, craft it into something well, the difference between making television in new zealand and making television in the states is that you know they get as much money for a pilot and for development as we get to make a first season right right they get a million dollars to do a dry run of a sitcom we get a million dollars and we make 22 episodes with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so so in new zealand your first season is kind of your pilot but I mean, here's my, my armchair theories, but I feel like we had just moved into the age of new media as well. And the idea of kind of um, cancel culture and death by review had sort of happened. And our first, the first season was not great, but it was definitely me and the team who had worked on it were like, right. So, but we figured out through this, we figured out what would actually make this show work. And we were all really hoping that we would get a second season, but we went through that. We were on TBNZ and our first three episodes were on a Thursday. Our second ep then got moved to a Friday. The fourth ep, they chuck on a Sunday. Right. Then by the time we got to the fifth ep, they moved it back to the Thursday because maybe that'll work. Didn't work on a Thursday. Chuck the last couple of eps on the Friday and then we'll just do the season finale on the Sunday. And we, you know, so we got that weird sort of TBNZ. It's like we are talking about about the Trump thing where you go, I feel like the only reason anyone is making these decisions is because they don't want the show to do well, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And it got bounced all over the place and it, and it didn't pan out, which was, I, I mean, I was bummed because Jackie Brown was hosting it, um, you know, and I feel that she was, she was doing an awesome job uh, at it and a second season for her would have been amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and people had kind of been clamoring for a less Boise, um, style of show yep, with, yep. with seven days in that and we had a way more uh open and diverse sort of casting view i was really me and jesse mulligan were kind of the only two crusty crusty old crustos who were on the thing 
Um, but yeah, I mean, that didn't pan out. At that point, though, when I was so, I mean, I was gutted because I was like, this is going to be amazing. I can come back and I can do this, make this show, um, and I'll be able to sort of stay relevant enough in New Zealand that I can come back and do a tour again later on in the year. Yeah. And that I would be able to keep my connection to New Zealand really strong. But, you know, we didn't, uh, TV instead kind of, kind of buried it and we were never able to come back but it's not it, do, it, it didn't really i personally it was, it was actually a really good thing because after that i came back here this, this was in 2016 this wasn't this was like election year this was 2016 or 17 but i kind of went you know what like i've got to change my game up because my whole life as a performer and the generation that i came up in in new zealand you know, you had to be, no matter how good you were, you still had to have someone put you in the place, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. someone still had to choose to put you on seven days or choose to put you on the radio or choose to have you host that, that nightly show. Um, and, uh, and you, not only that, you needed the funding, but I mean, nothing happens without uh, New Zealand on air throwing a chunk of change at it yeah so the sort of number of gatekeepers involved and in you ever being able to put your stuff out there was tremendous when i was kind of coming up and i thought to myself well you know like we're living in this new sort of age and there's so many ways for people to like create stuff and get it out there yeah i should have a look into this and i've always been into video games and i was talking to a buddy of mine about it and he said well look i've just started representing he works in um uh, like influencer management right uh -huh. and he goes oh well you should give twitch a go wriggles because it's just playing video games and having fun and it's a really good place to just kind of you know just just do stuff and try things out so i started broadcasting video games there and started sort of growing a community and seeing how um I don't know how much I, I was really intoxicated by how much control I could all of a sudden have over what I was doing. Yep. And just got really, really into the idea of, of independent content creation, which is a whole, it's a, it's really, it's a, I mean, it's an amazing journey to go on, especially when you are from the old white establishment era. Like I, I know for a fact that my journey through comedy in New Zealand was greased by being uh um easy to get along with white dude right, right? because the, every guy who booked a gig every dude who ran a tv show like i could i most of the gigs that i got i got from going and having a beer with a couple of people and being heaps of fun to hang out with at a house party in auckland in 2006 right yep and when you come into independent content creation that is that doesn't exist there's no like in a way gatekeepers actually were not a barrier for me they were actually a leg up which was a re i mean it was a great realization to have but all of a sudden going oh wait a minute like i'm here on seven days because three or four people made a decision and put me here yeah and then they kind of continued to make decisions on a weekly basis as to whether i would continue to be there as long as i can just stay friends with the producers of this i'll probably be able to keep getting on i know there's probably people who'd say wrigley you had like a smidgen of of talent or whatever and obviously <laughs> if you can make a live making a live audience well, laugh is hard well, i'm not going to say that like but there is that there is that know, adage, just, there is that adage of i mean i'm not saying this is you, you can't do it without talent but there is that adage of it's not what you know it's who you know and that's kind of what you're saying on you know what i it. always say it's not what you know it's not that it's not what you know it's who you know it's who knows what you can do right right so you with seven days you still need to be able to do the impossible which is within five seconds make a room full of live people laugh at what you're doing yep if i couldn't do that nepotism would have got me in the chair but an inability to make an audience laugh would have had me out of it yeah you know yep 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 um but having said all of that it's super interesting when you start working in the medium of independent content creation because there's no it's just you and the audience and however many people you can get to enjoy the thing that you're doing and even when it comes to kind of you know you you all of a sudden have to be your own promotions department you know mm -hmm. tv3 is not taking out a, a billboard um 
on Ponsonby Road for for the cast of Seven Days or whatever. Yep. And it reminded me heaps of when I first started doing stand up and I had to like make flyers for my own shows in there. But mm-hmm. just instead of having to drag myself out to gigs every night, that was a big part of it too, was that living out here in New York, I didn't know anyone. I was not established. And so in order for me to succeed as a comic here, I had to go back to living the life I lived when I was 19 years old and was, you know, eating two minute noodles and going and, and driving for five hours to do a gig for 10 bucks in Palmerston North, right? Mm-hmm. But when you have a, a son who's six months old, it's really, really difficult to do that. And so when I discovered online content creation, I was like, well, this is great because I can put the same amount of effort. Like it takes me four hours to drive to Canon Dagua to go and do a comedy gig yeah. for an hour and then another four hours to drive back. If I just spend that nine hours creating my own content in my studio i'm probably going to wind up getting a lot more out of that in the long run than i would out of going through that whole sort of networking shambles you know and i can maintain a presence in new zealand uh and yeah it's just been a really fun journey especially learning the gear the key thing i reckon that you got to get with this is you have to you have to be the first thing i tried to do was like i was gonna i'm gonna make the same sort of shit that i made on Jono and ben and I made this really great video when Pokemon Go came out where I built this giant Pikachu costume mm-hmm. and I had a buddy film me and I was following people around who were playing Pokemon Go dressed as a giant Pikachu and the I visual, like yeah. I knew, I was like, the visual is going to be so good because yeah. it's like people are looking for Pokemon, but they're in their phone and they can't see the one that's behind them. My producer brain saw the whole thing and I, I put like four days into it, right? Loved it, uploaded it. And then, you know, it, did, it was fine. Like got like 15,000 views or whatever, which is not not huge, right? But it was just sort of fine enough. But after that, I went, okay, we've really got to think about this because there was a whole lot of work and you had to coordinate several different people. And normally you'd have a production team who do this. And if you do this every time you need to make something, you're going to burn yourself out because the only way the only way you can garner an audience in online content creation is to be as consistent as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, you're better off uploading a stupid vlog every two days than one incredibly well-made out in public prank sketch or, or really well done piece of sort of cinematic sketch comedy or whatever every two weeks. Right. So learning sort of how to have like a really good production process that means that you know when you want to make something you can just get straight to it um has been super fun to learn and it's been a really cool thing to put together and it just is so weird now that i just finished building this kind of studio that allows me to do like when i'm live streaming on twitch i'm not very good at video games mostly what i do is just i have a green screen and like goof around and just do stupid stuff but it allows me on the fly to do that and it allows me to like it's going to be really easy for me to cut together um you know those sort of daily show style uh vlogs i've got like a little production process so that yep like you're kind of making it while you're writing it and all that sort of stuff yep i don't know it's just a really really weird situation for me though to sort of all of a sudden go all right well (laughs) My plan for the next three months was to just sit inside the studio and create content. And it turns out that there's nothing for me to do but sit inside the studio for three months and create content. But yeah, man, I don't know. I guess I just, uh, that was my whole life story there for you. <laughs> that was the last six years. But I don't know, you know, dude, I mean, you're doing the same thing. You've got your whole podcast scenario going on down in Dunedin. I saw that little video where you're trying to um, create a space where people who want to produce content. Yeah can kind of come in and, and get it done, you know? And I think that's one of my major things that I want to get out to young creatives and stuff, especially people who want to get into comedy. It's like, you don't need to really over, even overthink it. Like, don't try to overthink it. You've got someone like Pat who's going, if you want to do something, just come down here and do it, yep. you know? And I'm, you a, just, I'm, uh, a, I'm a firm believer in the philosophy that a rising tide lifts all boats. You know, it's like if someone 100%. if someone comes along to me and starts a, po- I mean, like as you can see, 
my bedroom. <laughs> with, uh, with my, I know, I'd see the love with, zone there. With my 90, yeah, I was going to do, I've got a, I, I can change colors. I was going to put it on, when I put it on red, it looks like a porn site. Um, with my lovely 1990s <laughs> yellow walls, because I'm not in my studio, obviously. I've tried to, it looks better at nighttime. But anyway, I've tried to kind of um, make it a bit more interesting. But if someone comes along to me in my studio and goes, I, in fact, I've had probably the, the, the coronavirus you know, thing for me that's annoyed me a little bit. I mean, other than it being incredibly serious and, you know, deadly to the w parts of the world, is that I was just getting to the point where I had a half dozen people kind of going, I'd like to do this. And I'm like, well, you know, show me what you want to do, submit it to me in writing, explain to me your podcast, and I'm happy to kind of get behind you and help you with it. And if one of those becomes, you know, massively bigger and more successful than mine, I'm just like, fucking yeah, that's awesome because me sharing my content will help yours and you sharing your content will help mine and the rising tide will lift all the boats and one of them will end up being more successful than the others whatever that successful whether it's views or dollars or whatever and i'm i'm totally cool with that and so i'm hoping that you know when we get back to the real world whether that's in three weeks from now saying we've been in a lockdown for a week or whether that's in six weeks from now or eight weeks from now um, I, I don't know. Maybe maybe this time out will give people more stories to tell, and maybe maybe our little uh, studio. People don't know what we're talking about. There's a little video on the Facebook page if they want to check it out. Um, but if people if people want to do something, they can. But the flip side to that as well, because what I was going to ask you about, without getting into your personal finances, is then the monetizing of it. Because you know we still got to put mm. food on the table. The flip side to it for me is, you know, I've I've had approaches from businesses. Because actually making a, a series of podcasts for a business is a really good way of doing sort of a native advertising run. So I'm I'm looking at making it available for creatives who just want to try, but I'm also looking at to make it available for, you know, to provide um, a production house for want of a better value for businesses as well. And that's hopefully going to help pay for the space. Obviously, I'm renting an office in a in a very cool, very supportive uh, shared office space. Um, who have been amazing to us, basically given us a space for 18 months for nothing. And now we've finally moved into an office where we're paying them a portion of what they'd normally get for rent. So they've been amazing to support us. And it's nice. a little bit of that pay it forward. I've been supported for the past 18 months and helped to get you know the Department of Conversation off the ground. And it's not that now I feel obliged to support others. I just think that's the philosophy that works. You know, the rising tide lifts all boats. If I can do something to help someone else take off, you know, Someone someone helped Rose Matafeo, for example. You mentioned her before. And look what she's doing now across in the UK on all those Channel 4 you know, panel shows and stuff. At some stage, someone, would, whether it was a parent or a teacher, would have given Lord her first guitar. You know, there's these things, and I'm not suggesting that through me someone's going to become world famous, but there's things that happen along the way that help the process for someone. And I'm all about creative content. I was talking to someone yesterday. The kind of documentaries I like most of all demonstrate the creative process uh so i'll watch a documentary like six days to Air, the south park documentary in awe of what they do you know i'll watch um back and forth by the foo fighters you know talking about the dave roll story and how they make albums and stuff and the creative process is something that always i'm always drawn to and i always like to see so what i hope is that i can be involved in watching some other people's creative process and what they're doing and if we can you know i've got the gear I've got the, well, normally got the spot. The building's locked down at the moment. But if we can be a part of that, then we want to be because, yeah, it's it's that, that rising tide will lift all boats. Yeah. Did you have a question about monetization? Yeah, what are you, so so you're you're obviously going to spend three months doing this. Um, what what are you doing for income and stuff at the moment? Are you, are you? Still... Well, so I've been doing this for, like I started, I started live streaming, um, after I made that, that YouTube video, because I was like, okay, it was looking at the monetization of it. I went in all this, I went bent over backwards to try and get this thing made. I was really proud of it and I put it out there. And then I basically just, you know, I just went, okay, if, in order for me to get into a position where I'm generating revenue out of this, yep. I need to do this level of back breaking shit for nothing mm -hmm. for the next three years, which is going to be just as annoying as trying to go out and reestablish myself as a stand up. Right live streaming is very different because you are essentially you put the work in at the front end yep. to um you know to be able to to just basically push a button and go live and then and then that's your content you know you're making it as you're as you're sharing it yep 
and I uh, on Twitch when I first started streaming on Twitch I was uh, I always enjoyed illustrating cartoons and the reason I, I kind of got into that side of it was a friend of mine um, a streamer by the name of Austin Marie who's a really talented illustrator uh, who I actually met in Dunedin when she was uh, she's from California but she was there as, a, as an exchange student and she was working for the um, uh, student union when we came down there to do uh, orientation comedy so I kind of met her through that kept tabs and she was streaming live streaming art to twitch right so live streaming her and her digital tablet set up so you can see what she's drawing and she's kind of hanging out there she was my first sort of exposure to twitch mm -hmm. and i just thought this is really cool she had about 120 uh people sort of watching her at the, t at the time um they're all in this chat room kind of talking to her she's maintaining this sort of semi one-sided conversation with the chat room and listening to music and there was just a really cool vibe to it uh and i was sort of was just really kind of drawn into that so i thought i'm gonna give this a go uh so i started doing that and twitch is a really really wonderful place for i think tw twitch is the perfect base income situation for anyone who wants to get into creative content because what you wind up creating for yourself on twitch is is a community it's less of like like I think a lot of people get into live streaming and they make the mistake of thinking that what you want to do is like live stream a like an informal television show mm -hmm. right to an audience of which is weird because when you have an audience of half a million people that, that's kind of the vibe right but it's like when you do stand up to a theater with 5,000 people in it it's different to when you do stand up to like six or seven so when people try to live stream, they kind of try to create this big sort of TV-ish experience. And I, I did, was trying to do that when I first got into it. I was like, I'm going to show these people something they've never seen before. And I realized I got it completely wrong. Because what people want on sites like Twitch is they want a sense of, of community, right? Yeah. You're like streaming for two, three, four, four hours. Some people stream for like eight or nine. Wow. For a lot of people, they're playing video games, right? Yeah. Like yeah. I know a lot of people uh, know that about Twitch, that it's a video game streaming site. And people don't really understand like how it works they go why would you why would you spend time watching someone else play a video game and what people don't get is that with twitch it's not about it's about the content but it's not so much about that as much as it's about the community so mm -hmm. you know you have people who make a really good living on twitch streaming video games uh they might be really good at first person shooters and they play games like fortnite and they play games like apex legends and they have you know, whenever they go live, they have 50 to 60 people watching the, their yeah. live stream, right? And you go, well, how can you support yourself on 50 to 60 concurrent viewers? You know, when you come from the land of television, you think you need like at least 100,000 people watching something in order for it to be to be successful. Yep. But what's actually going on there is those people who are there and who are part of that person's community, they're all sort of buying into not just the streamer but also each other and when that person goes live what's usually happening is all of the other people who are in that community they're kind of playing the same video game um you know they'll, they'll be in that streamers you know discord service which is like a huge sort of audio server where they'll all be hanging out and kind of playing their own games and the, and the streamer is kind of the sort of the figurehead of that that community through their entertainment they sort of unite everyone under this banner and um you know kind of through interacting with that chat room and then the chat room kind of interacting with itself and the streamer you know this it's a it, twitch is a weird it's it's very very cultish right it's very weird yeah but the community thing is what drives it it's not really a place where you would go uh i'm gonna go put out flagship content there are people who do and there is flagship content on twitch there are streamers on twitch who stream to 20,000 30,000 40,000 people concurrently um you know, and make millions of dollars doing it. But their their content and in, in the way that they run their community has uh, evolved into having this massive broad spectrum focus. But even in those places, even where you have people like Dr. Disrespect, who's a huge streamer who has an incredible level of production to his stream, he pretends to be this 1980s style villain who has this whole sort of futuristic cyberpunk setup and uses green screens and pretends that everyone who's watching are actually in this giant arena 
and they're part of a group called the Champions Club. And it's it's premium content, but it is still built on Twitch's core foundation of, of having a community. All of the people who are watching, you know, buy into this idea that they're sort of in this guy's world and by subscribing to his stream, you're a part of his community. But the reason that, that it works for someone who's streaming to like a small audience of like 60 to 100 people is because that that community, um, you know, as you're watching a streamer, you you just kind of start to buy into the idea of like, you know what, this is, I really like this, right? It's free for me to engage with this content whenever I want, but I am investing 20 to 30 hours a week having this person on in the background while I'm working or yeah. having this person on in the background while I'm playing the same game as them or I'm trying to be an illustrator. So I have Austin on in the background while I'm illustrating and they're, you know, there's there's this kind of thing where you then go okay like i'm gonna spend five bucks a month to subscribe to the stream even though i don't have to i'm gonna do it to try and keep it going and this this sort of shift takes place like i the best thing i can compare it to do is like create create new zealand on air right mm -hmm. as a taxpayer you pay money then new zealand on air take a chunk of that money and they decide what kind of content is going to get made with it Yep. Twitch is the opposite. Yeah. All of the content is getting made and then you decide which content you want your money to go towards. It's still, it's, 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 it's the arts as it has always functioned, except instead of the patron being a government body doling out a huge check mm -hmm. or, a, or a monarch, you know, giving heaps of gold doubloons to the local theater or whatever, it's just lots of little microtransactions in these little communities where, you know, if you have... If you have a community of, of, of 100 um, people uh, who are all supporting you and each one of those 100 people uh, chucks five bucks a month at what you're doing, yep. there's $500 that month that you've got from there. I got even further into that with Twitch because I sort of started to realize that um, you, you can do all these things. In so when you're streaming on Twitch, you can do things like if I'm streaming – and someone donates five dollars to the channel you can actually through obs and through the the different softwares that run it i could be in the middle of a game someone could donate five dollars and it will trigger a little message on screen trigger a little audio alert something will happen the, little guy comes dancing in or whatever it's the akin and to I, a super chat eh? i think youtube does the super chats twitch does yeah super chat them. is nowhere near advanced as right. twitch I, I i i know super chat and i've sort of seen what youtube tries to do but the the level of of uh, engagement on twitch just blows everything else out of the water and i saw but i saw an opportunity there because i had been streaming some video games for a while i was playing this old game called fallout that i was a huge fan of and um that was from a, a company called bethesda who allow you to modify their games and i just came up with this ludicrous system that slowly evolved over time where the people who were watching my stream could trigger events in the game which you know no one was really doing on twitch and i sort of saw an opportunity to make it happen and it became really really popular i'd be in the middle of a dungeon and someone would throw five dollars at the stream and all of a sudden the dungeon would be full of super mutants or whatever who were not normally there and because it was a game with a really big fan base people would kind of come in and they would you know they knew how the main story of the game would usually progress and they would spend so i mean like, dude, i had people come in and spend like hundreds of bucks wow. just spawning in huge armies of, of creatures but this is the thing is that it's one of those things where like you just there's no because there's no mandated rules about how twitch operates if you mm -hmm. have an idea there's a guy in dunedin called rudism who builds controllers out of just really weird shit he played an entire video game with an eggplant. The most Kiwi thing you'll mm -hmm. ever see. The guy tears controllers apart and then rebuilds them inside strange objects or uses like m motion control sensors and audio sensors. So he like has, you know, things where he, he was playing a flute and different notes that he was playing on the flute moved his character around. Wow. So there's levels of ingenuity that people kind of bring to it. But the monetization just comes from creating something that a community can get behind like rudism is someone who's hugely successful because 
the amount of effort that he puts into making stupid controllers is just something that's really you know he has a, a massive community who kind of get behind what he do what he what he does and like i say the thing i like about it the most is that it's voluntary patronage mm. you know you basically you kind of consume the content you decide that you like it and more often than not people will find it like i had a guy who's been a part of my streaming community for three or four years uh, and when he first started hanging out in my stream, he was like 17 years old right? and he didn't have any money and he would constantly, every time someone donated something to the channel or gave some kind of fiscal contribution, he'd be like, oh, I'm really sorry, I can't. And everyone was always like, it doesn't matter, dude. Like just being here is fine. Like no one's under any obligation to actually contribute to a streaming community ever. If people do, it's dope. But as soon as this guy went out and got a job, he came into my stream and he goes, I'm really, really excited today. And I said, why? And then I got a $150 PayPal donation on stream from this kid. Wow. And, you know, he goes, look, I know this this barely kind of covers the fact that I've been consuming your content for the last three years, but I just wanted to do something. And I was like, dude, the fact that, like, as soon as you got your first paycheck, the first thing that you wanted to do was, like, pay up for the content that you have been consuming it's so hugely encouraging to me as an independent content creator yeah. to know that 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 that's the vibe. That the vibe as a consumer is not, ha, 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 look at me. I'm a little content vampire getting all of my shit for free. That the vibe is, oh, man, I really, this person is putting effort into keeping me entertained and I want to do something to keep that going. And realizing that has been a really huge thing for me coming from that gatekeeper culture of realizing that, you know, when your entire audience is able to support you kind of voluntarily like that, um, it's really amazing, you know? I mean, I, I guess I've, to a certain extent as a stand-up, you do that because you do the comedy festival and people yeah, yeah, buy tickets yeah. to see your show, but they're buying tickets before they go to the show. It would be like doing a show in the comedy festival in just a big theater that a thousand people kind of walk through and you'd be stoked if any of them even just decided to sit down and take a seat and listen to you for an hour, you know, let alone actually drop 20 bucks in a bucket at the end when they walk out. Um, but, that, you know, the, the, the thing with content creation is that, that, that the monetization side of it just happens if you just sort of put the content first, I guess. Like yeah, I yeah. just kind of went a couple of years ago. I said, you know what? I've done stand-up comedy and I can always go back to it. I'm going to take a break from that. And I'm really going to knuckle down and see how this Twitch thing goes. Uh, I took six months off for personal reasons that I don't want to get into. Sure. And uh, I just came back uh, at the start of last week, right? Just as quarantine kicked off, I was like, right, well, I'm back to live streaming now. Right. And uh, I was really unsure. I was like, you know what? I haven't streamed for six months. I don't know if all of the people in my community are going to come back. I don't know if I'm going to be right back to square one. It was three years of kind of building to where I got. Uh, and the first day that I streamed, I saw all the familiar faces in my chat room. Nice. And last night, uh, when I started streaming again, I was down to like six paid subscribers who had for some weird reason stuck around and continued to support me even when I was offline. But last night, I uh, my I just, just got back up to 100 um you know paid subscriptions which is wow. like 500 bucks at like a base level plus there's all the stuff that kind of comes in over the over the course of the week but the fact that that community was just kind of right there and waiting and ready to pick up where we left off was just dope and yeah. like i just can't especially comics like if you have a personality and are moderately good at video games you got to be on twitch because i know mm -hmm. you're doing nothing with your day anyway I know you're just sitting around between masties f f trying to figure out what to do. You may as well go spend three hours on Twitch playing video games and start garnering a small community because, um, you know, it's, it's also like, I don't know, they're my, they're my whole backbone now. You know, I've got this weird little group of a couple of thousand people who pop in and out over the course of the week and I sort of weirdly, like I kind of know all of them and they're the sort of the backbone of my whole um, my whole plan as a content creator because I go do my little live streams on Twitch and now I'm just getting into producing content that, that fits more with my old life, you know, trying to make these kind of daily show style vlogs and then yep. uploading those to Facebook and YouTube. Yep. But live streaming on Twitch and just that, that community culture and the 
the monetization and the support sort of around it is just it's so different to everything that i'm used to but i just i think it's amazing i don't know i could go on about it forever well look dude we've been chatting for over an hour and a half and um have we yeah this is this is i always this say is outrageous i always say that not so much in my bedroom but in the studio it's a bit of a tardis time tardis um i'm wondering you uh, i mean over there it means what it's approaching seven o'clock your time in the evening yeah, it's seven o'clock now. So there might be fam quickly, family. Like, you know time what? I always feel really bad, Pat, when people do podcasts with me now because I'm in so isolated for so long. Anyway, whenever I talk to a New Zealander, I just kind of have every conversation that I've been <laughs> having in my head. So really, like you've, as you've experienced, you don't really need to do a lot because I just, just, I just get verbal diarrhea. Oh, you, just so you might not have been aware, but I, I just, I paused my screen at some stage and I went and made a cup of tea and it was just a. <gasps> no, I thought, and... I thought so. I thought that's what had <laughs> happened. Yeah. Um, listen, it's a very strange time we live in, but sure is. this has been a blast. And I guess what I'm going to yeah, say yeah. is, dude, if you want to catch up again, especially during this lockdown period, yeah. totally down for it. Um, well, do you know what? I reckon I I uh, I don't hear Tim Bad on. He's a good mate of mine. I yep. was saying to him the other day. I said, "There's there's a really there's a really good market right now for people that have decent microphones in their houses totally. to get together and start doing stuff." Yeah. Because it's the hardest thing for me is when I see people who you know you've got one guy who's put a ton of effort into making sure that he has some decent audio mm -hmm. and that's all fine and good but it doesn't mean anything if 50 percent of what people are listening to is like oh, yeah, no, I don't <laughs> mean, mate. you know it doesn't really mean anything so at the very least i think just consistent crisp audio alone is probably enough to get a lot of people excited that's funny you know i literally said to you before we started this recording that like it's just nice to see someone with a mic I mean, I, I don't hold anything against people who have been talking to me with their Apple Buds in because that's great. They're sure. making effort, but an actual mic. I mean, it is. Yeah. And, and, and unfortunately, I know how disgusted you are by having to use Zoom, but at least we're connecting well, studios. Not, it's, and, I've kind of warmed to it. Yeah. I've kind of warmed to it. I have this idea of, um, I was asking my wife about it the other day because I said, you know, like, can you could you do a live studio audience like via Zoom? Because what you want in comedy is you want the laugh track. It helps, but you don't want it to be fake. It's a mess. And I was saying, is that, you know, can I do, if I recorded my vlogs live on Zoom, like how many people can you get in? And okay. my wife goes, so let me oh, it's a good idea, but the problem is, dude, is you just have someone fucking eating soup in the background. And okay. Can I, can I, can I give, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of stories. So the last couple of nights, what I've tried to do, tried to do is actually do a, uh, a bit of a, at 9.30 p.m. here in New Zealand time, I've opened up uh, my live stream and I've opened up my Zoom account and I've put some restrictions on my Zoom account because in the first night, uh, the people coming in figured out how they could share their screen. So obviously I saw porn. <laughs> and I was like, well, let's see if people want to have a chat and do a kind of community catch up at the end of the day. Uh, and last night I did it again and it worked okay. But what you are going to get if you then live stream that is guys masturbating and and various things you don't so want. So here's the main, this is hilarious, because this is why, like I've just been talking to a mate of mine who's like trying to get into live streaming and he goes, uh, what what are the major things that I need to know about? And I said, the more you let them in, yep. the more trouble you're in for. And I found that with like doing, when I was started doing interactive streaming as well, where it was just like, I had this beautiful idea that it would be this big, beautiful freaking interactive thing the first piece of interactive streaming i did was for like for if you if you did something if you typed some command in the chat room like a fart noise would play right and in my head i'm thinking people are only going to do this at the opportune comedic moment no 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 I just had a four hour stream of just fart noises <laughs> just constantly <laughs> and that's the main thing you have to be aware of is that the desire to troll is always going to trump. Yeah. Right? That yeah. desire. But I tell you, I tell you what we were going I tell you what we were going to do. So the Dunedin Fringe Festival obviously got cancelled here. Um, but one of the ideas yeah. we had is we were going to, I, I was talking to them about it. It was sort of my idea. So I won't say this is on them, this is on me. We were going to put some of the Dunedin based 
people who are still here up on a stage with no audience and live stream it for them. So just to kind of do an online Dunedin Fringe Festival. One of the ideas, and I really like it, and this comes back to what you're talking about, is setting up a series of laptops in the seats where people would have been with individual Zoom accounts. And then people could have Zoomed in and sat in the seats watching the stage from their laptop. Um, obviously, there's a few technical requirements there, but you know, it was the beginnings of an idea of something sort of what you're talking about whilst not being just mm. everyone in one device, which causes the issues as well. Well, do you know what? I think that ultimately what has to, what you, and I actually think that, I think someone was telling me about this the other day. I think there is like an application that does something like this. Like there is definitely a live streamed audience scenario, but in theatre and that, there's the whole thing about the, the contract that you have with your audience, you know? So you, you know, if you if you if you just open the doors to the public and just let anyone come in to a live stand up show, you're gonna have a shit fight. You know? You're gonna have some idiot who's got no investment at all in the thing, just heckling and being horrible the whole time. Yeah. So there has to be some kind of buy in for the for the audience. Yeah. I think the only way that a Zoom audience works is if you are able to say to that audience like okay so we're going to have 30 you know we have a limit of 30 spots and if you're in this audience for a one hour show the obligations on you are to be wearing a head wearing headphones and be in a place where you're comfortable and you're not distracted you know you're kind of trying to get people to agree that they're not going to fuck off and make a cup of tea halfway through yeah, yeah, yeah. or start looking at their facebook part way through that they are going to be as attentive as they would be if they were sitting in like a, a, a small stand up theater for like 60 people, yeah. you know? Um, and you kind of, I think you'd need like a, almost like a front of house person, like someone whose job is to, you know, if someone does weirdly start sort of slurping, cause all you want, all you want, if you're doing comedy, you don't need to actually see the people you just want as the comedian. You want the laughter that you're hearing to be, a, an organic and genuine response to the jokes and yep. as the audience member you want the laughter that you're hearing to be that as well yeah and so as long as everybody knows that you've just got like 30 disembodied pieces of audio in the zoom scape who are all of them wearing headphones and all of them 100 percent focused on the content that is coming to them and the only thing that they're giving us is when and you know, I think that there would have to be like a real thing where you you would want people who are, are practice theatre audience people. You'd want people who have been to the theatre before and who kind of understand the decorum there and would actually get a kick out of the experience because you're asking them to a certain extent. You're saying, "Hey, look, I need you to imagine that you are sitting elbow to elbow in a theatre with all of these other yeah. laughs that you can hear, and you've got to try and work that audience." into a place where when a couple of them laugh they all laugh because it is the same but you need their imagination needs to do like a ton of work and i think if you could get them to agree they don't and the great thing is is they don't need to be sitting in a theater seat you go look go and get in bed get under the covers put your headphones on and get your laptop in front of you and mm -hmm. make yourself a cup of tea and then when the show starts just sit there with your cup of tea but just you've just got to give us your focus as much as you would if you, were, if you were sitting in a live theatre space. And I think if you can start to create those kind of what we would have called in the old in, in improv, like that contract with your audience for their attention. Yep. If you can create that on Zoom, I think it can work. Yeah. But without that, like without some sort of secret agreement among all the people who were there about how we're all going to behave, you're just going to have dudes waking off on your, <laughs> <laughs> on your thing, you know. And on, uh, on, I think that's the thing. <laughs> on that, on that, that might be a delightful note to to pop out on. Guys, whacking off on things. Yeah, bro. Hey, um, yeah. So listen, yeah. maybe may, let's talk to Tim. Let's do something. Let's connect. We've got proper sound. Uh, that's all that really matters. Well, I don't know if you've seen, like what Tim's doing. I think it's really. It's, I think it's neat. It's sort of. It's so. It's it's so daft. It's so him. But yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know. It's we'll. Oh, I just got a message from my wife saying, "When, when's, when are you going to be done with this guy?" That's what I was. That was what I was trying to say to you five minutes ago. It's like seven o'clock your time. It must be dinner time. So quick, because no, she knows as well. She's, you know what? She's probably sitting there going, "I don't, I don't know who this guy is, but I feel really bad for him." <laughs> because hey. 
<laughs> I she's been living with me for the last however long. She knows how bad I am whenever I talk to any Kiwis. So, so um, before we take off, me. let people know about your, your your how to find you on Twitch and how to find you on Facebook, and and we'll we'll go from there. Yeah, look, Twitch is. I mean, tw Twitch is something that you know if you. It's, I always find plugging Twitch is really odd. But yeah. like if you if you want if you're the kind of person who likes to have something on to keep you company, like particularly if you're someone who like works from home during the day and you've ever had the radio on to keep you company, you've had the TV on to keep you company, go and check Twitch out. Maybe not necessarily what I'm doing. I play video games and generally kind of bum around and eventually i'm going to be going back to this weird interactive thing that i was doing my twitch is a whole scenario though but i just especially now in this lockdown period just go and have a look at twitch there are heaps of different categories there's people playing video games um there's people making there's a whole category called art where you can see amazing illustrators painters doing stuff chatting to their chat room at the same time when you're socially isolating like we are the kind of content that is out there on Twitch is really, really good. And becoming, you know, all what Twitch is, is it's, it's finding something that you enjoy, watching that chat room, looking at everyone chatting to each other in the streamer, and just getting out the courage to create a username for yourself and hopping into that chat room and going, hey, I'm new to Twitch, I'm really enjoying this, but I kind of don't know what to do. Yeah. Because it is like any cult, that entire community will turn to you and be like, one of us, one of us. <laughs> and they'll be more than happy to show you the ropes. There's a huge, learn there's just as big of a learning curve to being an audience member and a viewer on Twitch as there is to being a streamer. But it is so worth going through because once you understand that culture of being a viewer and being an audience member in a live streaming environment, and there's not even, there's more to cover there than you could in a two hour podcast, let alone one that goes for a day. Yeah. But it's a journey of discovery that I think anyone, anyone who is looking for some content to keep them company, anyone particularly, and I know there's so many people in New Zealand who are like this, people who love artists and love, you know, engaging with artists, but also love being able to support an artist on their own terms. Twitch is an amazing place to not just do that yourself, but, find other people who do it you know it's like oh there you go that's is he live now i should probably be watching him i'm a huge fan oh that's my i'm hosting that's so that's me and you can see down there i'm hosting dr disrespect who's probably one of the biggest streamers on on all of twitch he's a huge deal so there you go i've Smash just i'm just followed uh Rigel mania and we'll um... but i just encourage people to just go and and check what you out and, and give it a look around because there's so much content on that site but just learning how to be an active viewer on twitch and figuring out what it means to sort of integrate yourself into a twitch community and there's heaps of streamers in new zealand who are worth getting into cool um and checking out and you can like search the new zealand australia hashtag so really instead of kind of promoting myself i just generally want to promote um the twitch sphere which we've barely covered if i can ever figure out how to send you my OBS feed that next time we do this, I will just show you some of the goofy shit that I do on Twitch. Cool. Just because it's, that's wild. Well, and let, yeah, Rudism. R-U-D-E-I-S-M. Let's um, Go check him out because he's a fellow Dunedin guy for you. Let's plan on doing that. Let's plan at some stage during this lockdown. I'll connect again. We'll go, yeah. we'll go part two. Believe it or not, we've done an hour and uh, 47 uh, we'll end up doing another. Is this the longest podcast you've done no, so far? No, we did Flat Earthers for over two hours. They were fantastic. Um, yeah. Oh so. yeah, I'm not. I can't. I'm not. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not trying to. I'm not going to touch the Flat Earthers for <laughs> garbage talk. Hey, Steve Wrigley. Thanks so much for giving us some time today, and um, let's no catch up again Pat. super soon. Sometime I've given you a ton. All right, buddy. Have a good one. Take it easy, man. Nice talking to you.